Larry Morris uh, was formerly an editor with the same Joseph Smith papers that I alluded to. Uh, he wrote a book that I haven't seen, but um, and I was going to, if I knew you better, I'd kid and say, The Fate of the Corpse, it must be a murder mystery. <laughs> <laughs> fate of the Core, what became of the Lewis and Clark explorers after the expedition. Uh, Jim, that's as good as I'm going to do, humor-wise, sorry. Um, he's published many articles in uh, a number of uh, sources, uh, Miss Missouri uh, Historical Review, American History, Journal of Mormon History, BYU Studies, and more. Uh, as I think I said, or wanted to, uh, this is published by Oxford University Press, which is no small feat to have them accept your manuscript and publish it, and they always do uh, a wonderful job uh, in their publications and their production work and so on. Um, Brent Gardner, who a lot of you are probably familiar with, uh, who did uh, Book of Mormon commentary, etc., <coughs> said Larry Morris's book is the essential bedrock upon which future studies of the Book of Mormon will be based. Whether mine for understanding the believer's viewpoint or its reception among the wider population, these are documents that matter. Morris has collected the essentials for both novice and specialist alike. The carefully edited and introduced collection provides a rich and rounded view of this important topic in American history. So I uh, will now turn the time over to Larry Morris. Thanks very much. I appreciate Kurt and his staff uh, organizing this event, and I appreciate all of you coming. The, the period I cover in the book is a six and a half year period from uh, March, I mean from uh, September of 1823 when Joseph Smith said uh, Moroni first appeared, to March of 1830 when the Book of Mormon was published. And uh, as Kurt mentioned, I've done some Lewis and Clark research, so it's, and that, uh, the expedition basically happened 20 years before the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. So it's interesting to compare what kind of documents a historian, a Lewis and Clark historian has compared to what a Mormon historian has. You can take the, uh, for the expedition, you can take the period from uh, 1803, the year before the expedition officially started, to 1807, one year after the expedition, and you've got a wealth of sources. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, of course, was the person behind the expedition, and he uh, kept, he, he was very prolific writing letters, and he kept them, and we have many, if not all, of his letters. So the correspondence between Jefferson and all these other people, when he first had the idea of an expedition back in 1780s, you have all of that, you've got the letters written between Lewis and Clark, and then for the expedition itself, Lewis and Clark and uh, four other members of the expedition were keeping daily journals. So for the expedition you have about a million words worth of journals covering every single day of the expedition. Now think about the uh, Book of Mormon. Uh, Moroni first appeared in 1823 and Joseph Smith obtained the plates in September of 1827 and for that uh, four-year period nothing. You don't have a single document mentioning the Book of Mormon, which is really surprising. Uh, nobody mentioned it in any, none of the Smith family mentioned it in any letters or diaries or anything like that, nor did any of the neighbors mention it in their correspondence, diaries, and it wasn't as far as, at least we have no extant newspaper articles that mention the Book of Mormon in that time. So for that crucial uh, four-year period, you don't have anything. Now let me tell you one other thing about Lewis and Clark. Despite having 
so much documentation that can kind of create its own problem. This, this is a good example. Um, there was a, uh, John Coulter was a member of the expedition and in September of 1804 they were in present day South Dakota and he was out hunting and after his hunt his horse disappeared and uh, he discovered it had been taken by Lakota Indians and they had this encounter with the Lakota and maybe that's one reason all the journalists that uh, made an entry for that day September 24th 1804 they all mentioned uh, Coulter hunting because I guess of what it led to and William Clark in his journal said uh, John Coulter killed four elk John Ordway said uh, Coulter killed two elk and one deer then Patrick Gass didn't identify Coulter he just said one of our men was out hunting and he killed three elk <laughs> and Joseph Whitehouse said it was Coulter who killed two elk so you don't have of those four they're all different <laughs> the, one, the, the one thing they seem to agree on is that, that he killed at least two elk and three of them identified him as identified the hunter as Coulter but to me, that's a good symbol of what historians deal with. Because even when you have people recording the event on the very day that it happened, you've got uh, interesting differences. Uh, back to the Book of Mormon. For that four-year period, you don't have any documents whatever. And for 1828, we've got one document. The revelation that uh, later became Doctrine and Covenants section 3. But even that document is not a document created in 1828. It's the, it's the copy that John Whitmer <coughs> supposedly made from the original, but his copy was made in 1831. Then in 1829, February and March, two more revelations, DNC 4 and DNC 5. And it's all the way to uh, June of 1829 before you really get some important, other than revelations, where you, you get other kinds of documents. Uh, in 18, from uh, June of 1829 to March of 1830, we have several letters. We've got the statements of the three witnesses and the eight witnesses, an agreement between Martin Harris and Joseph Smith and uh, quite a number of newspaper articles talking about the Book of Mormon. So it's great to have, but you don't have the thing that is so important <coughs> in Lewis and Clark historiography, the journals. You don't have any a diary or journal accounts describing what was happening in uh, 1829. So there's a serious lack of uh, documentation when you're trying to tell the story. And the upshot is the great majority of documents in this volume are reminiscences. And it's just uh, problematic by its very nature since uh, memory is so mysterious <coughs> and people remember things, really they perceive things and remember things differently and you just have to do the best you can. Uh, my goal was to apply uh, good source criticism and uh, all things being equal I believe I would always uh, privilege a first-hand source over a second or third hand or anonymous source and I think it's generally true that uh, <coughs> Accounts that are recorded near the time of the event tend to be more reliable than late accounts. And then I would also look f uh, to be to see what details could be corroborated by another source. And I believe that's uh, those are good reasons why the 1832 account of the first vision I find so valuable. Um, it's written in Joseph Smith's hand. It's the only account of the first vision written in his hand. And it was written in, like I said, 1832. 
So some years have passed, 12 years since 1820, but it is nevertheless the earliest account of the first vision, and it is uh, corroborated uh, by other sources. But you can't automatically conclude that a late source isn't good. And we've got a very good example of that. Uh, John H. Gilbert was involved in the printing of the Book of Mormon, and he, uh, he actually punctuated the text. Because Oliver Cowdery, of course, was the scribe for uh, most of the Book of Mormon, and he did not uh, punctuate the manuscript. Uh, John Gilbert did that. With after he got permission from uh, Hiram and Oliver, he punctuated the first edition of the Book of Mormon. And he lived a long life, and in uh, 1892, Gilbert, he was 90 years old, and it had been, let's see, 60-something years since the event in question had happened, but Gilbert wrote up a memorandum about his experience. And uh, Royal Skousen has done great work on the original and the printer's manuscripts of, of the Book of Mormon. Royal Skousen's analysis of Gilbert's text involved fragments of the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon, the printer's copy, about 100 copies of the 1830 edition, an original proof sheet of the 1830 title page, and a complete set of unbound sheets from the 1830 edition, sometimes called the uncut sheets, that Gilbert had saved. From his exhaustive evaluation of the evidence, Skousen concluded that Gilbert's memory is very accurate even at 90 years of age and 63 years after the fact. <coughs> Pretty amazing. Huh. So it's, it's uh, you got to be careful making conclusions about uh, late documents. Uh, another thing I discovered was that you have to carefully consider what it means to be a first-hand document. This foundational text of Mormonism, I, I assume that's for sale here. <coughs> it's by some editors of the uh, Joseph Smith papers. Two of my uh, most important sources were Joseph Smith's 1839 history and Lucy Matt Smith's history. But with those, you have to be cautious. Uh, this is what they say about um, the 1839 history. In 1971, after years of careful research, Dean Jesse published his article, The Writing of Joseph Smith's History showing that none of the extant manuscripts behind the printed history were in Joseph Smith's handwriting, nor were they in the handwriting of a single scribe taking down Joseph's oral dictation. Instead, the history was written by more than a dozen different scribes and clerks. Combining their efforts to review the journals, letters, and other extant documents left behind by Smith and his close associates, and to copy, revise, and otherwise utilize those documents to create a seamless narrative written in an autobiographical voice. So with many, virtually all of the documents, if someone wrote uh, he, referring to Joseph Smith in the third person, the editors of the history changed that to I. While Joseph Smith had initiated the production of this history and oversaw the ongoing effort, his initial involvement apparently gave way to that of his office staff. Uh, when he died, they had finished little more than half of his years as church president. The historians and clerks continued on after his death, completing the last several years of his life a dozen years later. So that's really good information to have when, when you're using the 1839 history. Lucy's history 
Uh, Sharon Howcroft wrote a good article about that. And she says, the liberal <laughs> manipulation and repurposing of text by the editors had undeniable repercussions on the history. Lucy's pure, unadulterated voice is intermittent and sometimes simply non-existent. And uh, sh she has a chart where she shows all the different manuscripts involved and who used what. It's extremely complicated. And sometimes it's, it's very hard to know if it's Lucy speaking or someone else speaking. So there are a lot of interesting wrinkles involved. I, uh, I characterize both of those sources as first-person sources from Joseph Smith with the understanding that they were really written by committee. Uh, some of the interesting issues that came up as I was working on this book, uh, one is there's kind of been a, a, a discussion or a debate. Some historians feel that uh, when Joseph Smith first told the story, well, they, they believe that he first told a, a money-digging, what, what one author called a money-digging yarn, uh, out treasure seeking and and finding something that was guarded by a guardian angel and uh, kind of the f folk magic of the day that the story began in that way and that eventually it evolved into the story a religious story of angel of an angel and plates where the uh, LDS apologists will argue that Joseph first told the story, the religious account. But since we have uh, no documents from that 1823 to 27 time period, neither side can really prove their case. And the uh, when the narrations of the Book of Mormon, of how the Book of Mormon came about, were finally recorded, this was after Joseph Smith had become well known and, and he had uh, people who really loved him and people who hated him. So there was this great division of opinion on Joseph Smith had occurred by the time the narratives of the Book of Mormon were uh, recorded or published. And let me give you an example of how I uh, tried to deal with that. The total absence of uh, primary documents related to the Book of Mormon between 1823 and 1827 puts any historian in a bind. Ultimately, writes Mark Ashurst McGee, the treasure guardian thesis is unfalsifiable and therefore, in a sense, falls outside the domain of history into the realm of belief. Of course, that also means that the angel first thesis is similarly unfalsifiable. Uh, conclusions about what story Joseph first told and how that story may have changed over the next few years reach beyond the documentary evidence. At the same time, um, documentation is available to analyze how Joseph's 1839-41 history, the one now included in the LDS canon, differs from accounts provided by both before and after by a variety of sources. So I had uh, 13 sources, people who heard the story of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and uh, all of them heard the story from Joseph himself or from Joseph Sr. or Martin Harris between 1823 and 1830. And there were some very interesting parallels, even though you've got a, a diverse audience that includes both uh, hostile and friendly sources. The textual evidence 
uh, indicates that the most common scenario reported by the 13 sources goes something like this. Joseph claimed that an angel appeared to him in the midst of a prayerful setting and announced that he had been commissioned by God to bring forth an ancient record. The plates disappeared after Joseph first removed them from the stone box. A shock prevented him from removing the plates a second time, and the angel instructed him to bring someone with him to obtain the plates. Some say that was uh, Alvin Smith, and some say that it was Emma Smith. <clears throat> and those, those details of the plates disappearing Joseph being shocked or thrown back by a supernatural force when he tried to get the plates back, and his being instructed to bring someone with him, of course he eventually brought Emma with him when he obtained the plates, those details are, are included in the friendly sources such as Oliver Cowdery and Lucy Mack Smith and uh, Joseph Knight, and they're also included in the, in the accounts from the hostile sources the neighbors who didn't believe Joseph uh, bring up these details. But they are not included in the uh, 1839 history. Another fascinating episode that I was able to research was the uh, Martin Harris and Charles Anton story. And this is really interesting because the best sources on this subject come from Charles Anton. He wrote uh, three letters describing his experience uh, with Martin Harris. And uh, the, the first was uh, written in 1834, so that's 15 years, 16 years, Martin Harris went to see Charles Anthony probably in February of 1828. So that's 16 years after the fact. Then he wrote another letter in 1841 and a third letter in 1844. But that's before uh, Martin Harris <coughs> gave a first person account. Uh, he wrote a letter in November of 1870 where he talked about uh, his experience with Charles Anton. And let me give you a little example of what uh, Anton said. In his first letter, he said, The whole story about my having pronounced the Mormonite inscription to be, quote, Reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics, quote, is perfectly false. And then he goes in to the uh, discussion, some years ago a plain and simple-hearted farmer calling upon me with a note from Dr. Mitchell requested me to decipher, if possible, a paper which the farmer would hand me and which Dr. Mitchell confessed he had been unable to understand. Uh, I soon came to the conclusion that it was all a trick, perhaps a hoax. And then he goes into a discussion of... Uh, what Martin told him about the translation, uh, a young man who had the trunk containing the book and spectacles in his sole possession, this young man was placed behind a curtain in the garret of a farmhouse and thus being concealed from view, put on the spectacles occasionally or rather looked through one of the glasses, deciphered the characters in the book and having committed some of them to paper, handed copies from behind the curtain to those who stood on the outside. And you remember in the Martin Harris account, of course it's dangerous to call it the Martin Harris account, because in, the 18, in Joseph Smith's 1832 history, he gives an account of Martin's experience. And in 1839, there's an account of, of Martin's experience. And the 1839 account is in first person, indicating that uh, Martin Harris wrote it or recited it. But those, those are questionable conclusions. At any rate, uh, Martin Harris reportedly said, I think that's the safe way to put it, 
that uh, Charles Anton gave him, he, he certified that the characters were genuine, you know, signed a statement and gave it to him. And then when he asked, well, how did you come about, how did you get these characters? When, when Martin Harris told him the uh, miraculous story, Anton reportedly asked for the paper and ripped it up and didn't want to have anything to do uh, with this wild story about uh, gold plates and uh, spectacles. So in, in, Her in uh, Anthens, 1834 letter, the first one he wrote that we know of, he said, Harris requested an opinion, although he never, he never names him, he requested an opinion from me in writing, which of course I declined giving. And then he then took his leave, carrying the paper with him. So he says, I didn't, he, he asked me to sign something and I wouldn't do it. This is the letter that Charles Anton wrote seven years later in 1841. On my, on my telling the bearer of the paper that an attempt had been made to impose on him and defraud him of his property, because Harris had said he was going to uh, help uh, finance the publication of the Book of Mormon. This is in 1828, uh, two years before the Book of Mormon was published. He requested me to give him my opinion in writing about the paper which he had shown me. I did so without hesitation, partly for the man's sake and partly to let the individual behind the curtain see that his trick was discovered. The import of what I wrote was, as far as I can now recollect, simply this, that the marks on the paper appeared to be merely an imitation of various alphabetical characters and had, in my opinion, no meaning at all connected with them. <coughs> it's really fascinating that he, this, now he remembers giving Martin Harris a statement, but really, in his mind, he was giving it to him so that uh, the fraud would be discovered. But that's an interesting contradiction that in, in the one letter he says, I specifically says, I didn't sign anything for him, and in the next letter he says, he did. Hmm. When Martin Harris wrote a letter in 1870, he just gives the briefest of information. He said, I do say that the angel did show to me the plates containing the Book of Mormon. Further, the translation that I carried to Professor Anthon was copied from these same plates. Also, that the professor did testify to it being a correct translation. This is a, a really interesting part of the whole experience that Martin reported. Because here he's saying, he seems to be saying that he had a translation with him at the time. But uh, Dan Vogel points out a really crucial detail of this letter. He says, the translation that I carried was copied from these same plates also. It seems that uh, Martin Harris is using the word translation when he really means transcription because it was the transcription that was copied from the plates. And I think uh, uh, Dan Vogel really has a good point there to consider. The uh, 1832 history, in uh, and this part of the 1832 history is, is part that's written in Joseph Smith's own hand. Saying that he, meaning Martin Harris, immediately came to Susquehanna. Well, the, uh, Martin Harris had a vision in which he saw the marvelous work he was about to do. And he immediately came to Susquehanna. This was when Joseph and Emma were down in Harmony, Pennsylvania. And said that the Lord had shown him that he must go to New York City with some of the characters. So we proceeded to copy some of them, and he took his journey to the eastern cities and to the learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. 
And the learned said, I cannot. And that's what Anthon himself said. It didn't make any sense to me. But, uh, and this is, uh, okay. And the learned said, I cannot. But if he would bring the plates, they would read it. But the Lord had forbid it, and he returned to me and gave them to me to translate. This is Joseph speaking. Uh, Martin came back with the characters and gave to me to translate. And I said, I cannot, of course, alluding to the uh, prophecy in Isaiah, I cannot, for I am not learned, but the Lord had prepared spectacles for to read the book thereof. I commenced translating the characters, and thus the prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled, which is written in the 29th chapter. So according to Joseph Smith's 1832 history, Martin took a transcription, not a translation, and that Joseph Smith began translating after uh, Martin returned. Now, the 1839 history is different. And remember, this this is the uh, the history that was written by committee sometime in this month of February, 1828. The aforementioned Martin Harris came to our place, got the characters which I had drawn off <coughs> of the plates, and started with them to the city of New York. From what took place relative to him and the characters, I refer to his own account of the circumstances as he related them to me after his return, which was as follows. I went to the city of New York and presented the characters which had been translated with the translation thereof to Professor, Professor Anthony, Martin called him, a gentleman celebrated for his literary attainments. Professor Anthony stated that the translation was correct more so than any he had before seen translated from the Egyptian. That's really a problem because uh, does anyone know when the when the uh, Rosetta Stone was translated? Eighteen fifteen. <laughs> I don't think that Anthon would have had the knowledge to translate. I think that's for certain. Regardless of when the Rosetta Stone was translated, I don't think that Anthon would have had the ability to translate Egyptian. Pretty, pretty certain about that. I then showed him that those which were not yet translated, and he said that they were Egyptian, Chaldaic, Assyri Assyriac, and Arabic, and he said that they were true characters. He gave me a certificate, certificate certifying to the people of Palmyra that they were true characters and the translation of such of them as had been translated was also correct. So, 1799. Oh, it was when it was translated. Uh -huh. okay. Well, that was when it was found. Oh, found. 1822. Oh, that that's, yeah. that's a good question. 1822, when it was deciphered. 1822. Thank you. So, it's fairly recent. Yeah, right. 1822. Uh, theoretically, someone could, could have deciphered uh, Egyptian, <coughs> but uh, not Charles Anthon. Now, the... From this, uh, you know, this little excerpt I read from the 1839 history, this is what the uh, Joseph Smith uh, papers had to say about that. This is citing the Joseph Smith papers. The origin of the Harris account quoted here in the 1839 history is unknown. In none of the earlier accounts of this episode was there an indication that Harris took a copy of Joseph's translation of the characters to Anthony or Mitchell. Moreover, Anthony denied that Harris had a translation, and Joseph's 1832 history says nothing about Harris taking a translation with him, and strongly indicates that Joseph did not commence his translation until after Harris returned. Very interesting to see that difference between the 1832 history and the 1839 <coughs> history. Uh, based on my research, I don't think that Joseph Smith attempted to translate until after 
uh, Martin Harris uh, returned from New York City. Let me give you an interesting uh, res responses to meeting Joseph Smith for the first time. This, uh, you know, when uh, Josiah Stoll hired uh, Joseph Smith Sr. and Jr. to help him search for uh, <coughs> lost treasure, that was 1825, and so they went down to uh, southern New York and uh, northern Pennsylvania in that quest. And we've got some good statements from uh, people who met them at that time. First is Isaac Hale. And he, uh, he gave this statement in 1834. I first became acquainted with Joseph Smith Jr. in November of 1825. He was at that time in the employ of a set of men who were called money diggers, and his occupation was that of seeing or pretending to see by means of a stone placed in his hat and his hat closed over his face. In this way, he pretended to discover minerals and hidden treasure. His appearance at that time was that of a careless young man, not very well educated, and very saucy and insolent to his father. Smith and his father and several other money diggers boarded at my house while they were employed in digging for a mine. They, as they supposed, had been opened and worked by the Spaniards many years since. And then he tells how uh, young Smith made several visits at my house and at length asked my consent to his marrying my daughter Emma. This I refused and gave him my reasons for doing so. Uh, but he carried off my daughter to the state of New York. They were married without my permission. And then he says, Smith stated to me that he had given up what he called glass looking and that he expected to work hard for a living and was willing to do so. He also made arrangements with my son, Alba Hale, to go to Pal Palmyra and move his uh, furniture to this place. Alva went and helped them, and they moved to Harmony. Soon after this, I was informed that he, they had brought a wonderful book of plates down with them. I was shown a box, which it is said, in which it is said they were contained, which had to all appearances been used as a glass box of the common window glass. I was allowed to fill the weight of the box, into which, however, I was not allowed to look. And this is uh, Isaac Hale, had a good reputation, and uh, as far as we know, was a very honorable man, but he never was really uh, convinced by any of the things that Joseph said about the uh, plates. Joseph Smith, a junior, resided near me for some time after this, and I had good opportunity of becoming acquainted with him and somewhat acquainted with his associates, and I conscientiously believed from the facts I have detailed that the whole Book of Mormon, so-called, is a silly fabrication of falsehood and wickedness got up for speculation and with a design to dupe the credulous and unwary and in order that its fabricators may live upon the spoils of those who swallow the deception. In contrast, you have uh, Joseph Knight, Jr., who met Joseph Smith uh, around the same time, and the Knights lived not too far from Palmyra, but it was in, uh, their home was in New York along the Susquehanna. My father bought uh, three other farms and hired many hands. In 1826, he hired Joseph Smith. Joseph and I worked together. My father said Joseph was the best hand he ever hired. We found him a boy of truth. He was about 21 years of age. I think it was in November he made known to my father and I that he had seen a vision that a personage had appeared to him and told him, where there was a gold book of ancient date buried, and if he would follow the directions of the angel, he could get it, we were told in secret. I being the youngest son, my two older brothers did not believe in such things. My father and I believed what he told us. 
and I think we were the first after his father's family. He went to see for them, but did not go as he was told, so he could not get them, talking about the plates. The father has given the particulars, I will skip over, too bad he did that. At last he got the plates and rode in my father's wagon and carried them home. So isn't it interesting that uh, Isaac Hale and uh, Joseph Knight Sr. and Joseph Knight Jr. could have such different experiences uh, with Joseph the prophet. Uh, one other interesting uh, contrast. One of the accounts given of the experiences of the uh, witnesses, or experience, uh, came from Thomas Ford, who was governor of Illinois when uh, Joseph and Hiram were murdered. And uh, Ford later, uh, later wrote a book about the history of Illinois, and he has a section on uh, Joseph Smith. And this is Thomas Ford. The most probable account of these certificates, the statements of the three and eight witnesses, is that the witnesses were in the conspiracy, aiding the imposture. But I have been informed by men who were once in the confidence of the prophet that he privately gave a different account of the matter. It is related that the prophet's early followers were anxious to see the plates the prophet had always given out that they could not be seen by the carnal eye, but must be spiritually discerned that the power to see them depended upon faith and was the gift of God. <clears throat> That's certainly true for the uh, three witnesses, because they themselves said that they, uh, they needed faith to see the plates. And uh, he continues, Ford continues, it was the gift of God to be obtained by fasting, prayer, mortification of the flesh, and exercises of the spirit, that so soon as he could see the evidences of a strong and lively faith in any of his followers, they should be gratified in their holy curiosity. He set them to continual prayer and other spiritual exercises to acquire this lively faith by means of which the hidden things of God could be spiritually discerned. And at last, when he could delay them no longer, he assembled them in a room, and produced a box, which he said contained the precious treasure. The lid was opened, the witnesses peeped in, but making no discovery, for the box was empty, they said, Brother Joseph, we do not see the plates. The prophet answered them, O ye of little faith, how long will God bear with this wicked and perverse generation? Down on your knees, brethren, every one of you, and pray God for the forgiveness of your sins, and for a holy and living faith which cometh down from heaven. The disciples dropped to their knees and began to pray in the fervency of their spirit, supplicating God for more than two hours with fanatical <coughs> earnestness, at the end of which time, looking into the box, they were now persuaded that they saw the plates. I leave it to philosophers to determine whether the fumes of an enthusiastic and fanatical imagination are thus capable of binding the mind and deceiving the senses by so absurd a delusion. Well, Ford, Ford's account is uh, it's third hand at least. Because he got it from someone who, who supposedly got it from uh, Joseph Smith, but we're not told who his sources were. So we don't know, well, when the sources are anonymous, there's a little the historian can do other than to look for corroboration elsewhere. Certainly this account doesn't have any uh, corroboration. Nevertheless, uh, such as historians as um, Fawn Brody mm -hmm. use this as if it's a valid source. And uh, Dale Morgan also uh, uses this quote from Thomas Ford, which really surprised me because in his work in, uh, in the early fur trade and Jedediah Smith and William Ashley and some other prominent uh, people at that time, uh, Dale Morgan was so meticulous in his research that I, I was surprised he didn't have better uh, criticism 
of this anonymous source from Thomas Ford. Uh, this is what the 1839 history uh, says about the experience. Uh, Martin Harris, David Whitmer, and Oliver Cowdery and myself agreed to retire into the woods to try and obtain by fervent and humble prayer the fulfillment of the promises given in, in this revelation that they should have a view of the plates. We accordingly made a choice of a piece of woods convenient to Mr. Uh, Whitmer's house, this was in Fayette, New York, to which we retired, and having knelt down, we began to pray in much faith to Almighty God to bestow upon us a realization of these promises. According to uh, previous arrangement, I commenced by vocal prayer to our Heavenly Father and was followed by each of the rest in succession. We did not yet, however, obtain any answer or manifestation of the divine favor of our behalf. And this, this account is largely uh, corroborated by David Whitmer. We again observed the same order of prayer, each calling on and praying fervently to God in rotation but with the same result as before. Upon this second failure, Martin Harris proposed that he would withdraw himself from us, believing as he expressed himself that his presence was the cause of our not obtaining what we wished for. He accordingly withdrew from us, and we knelt down, and had not been many minutes engaged in prayer, when presently we beheld a light above us in the air of exceeding brightness, and behold, an angel stood before us. In his hands he held the plates, which we had been praying for these to have a view of, he turned over the plates one by one so that we could see them and discern the engravings thereon. He addressed himself to David Whitmer and said, David, blessed is the Lord, and he that keep his commandments. When immediately afterwards we heard a voice from out of the bright light above us saying, these, these plates have been revealed by the power of God and they have been translated by the power of God, the translation of them, which you have seen is correct, I command you to bear record of what you now see and hear. So, some similarities to what Ford said, but quite a bit different. Uh, the chapters that I have in the book uh, the first describes um, the appearances of Moroni from 1823 to 1826. Uh, the second, uh, the period when uh, Joseph and Emma moved uh, to Pennsylvania, September to December of 1827. Chapter 3 is Martin Harris's venture to the Eastern Scholars. Four, uh, the beginning of the translation in harmony, uh, Joseph translating with uh, Martin Harris's scribe. Five, uh, Martin Harris and the missing 116 pages. Six, the interlude, autumn of 1828 to March of 1829. Uh, seven is the uh, Joseph and Oliver translating in from April to May of 1829. Eight is the uh, completion of the translation in June of 1829 in Fayette at the Whitmer Farm. Uh, nine is the experience of the three witnesses. Ten is the uh, experience of the eight witnesses. And eleven is the uh, publication of the Book of Mormon. And the first uh, newspaper mention that we know of for the Book of Mormon, it came on June 26, 1829, in the Wayne Sentinel, which was a, a Palmyra, New York newspaper. And it said, Just about in this particular region, for some time past, much speculation has existed concerning a pretended discovery through superhuman means of an ancient record of a religious and divine nature and origin written in ancient characters impossible to be interpreted by any to whom the special gift has not been imparted by inspiration. It is generally known and spoken of as the Golden Bible. So it's 
It's not what you would call an attack on Joseph Smith. It's, you know, it sounds like a fair-minded uh, little editorial. And then uh, it adds, as a curiosity, the title page of the book was reprinted. Now, two months later, a different newspaper, the Palmyra Freeman, sounded quite a different note. The greatest piece of superstition that has ever come within our knowledge now occupies the attention of a few individuals in this quarter. It is generally known and spoken of as the Golden Bible. An account of this discovery, talking of plates of gold and a huge pair of spectacles, was soon circulated. The subject was almost invariably treated as it should have been, with contempt. <laughs> Then, in uh, 2003, Book Magazine included the Book of Mormon in its list of 20 books that changed America. In 2011, Ben Bratley, the chief theater critic for the New York Times, praised a Broadway musical he described as blasphemous, scurrilous, and more foul-mouthed than a David Mamet on a blue streak. <laughs> He's a playwright and, and <laughs> a lot of... Uh, rough language, as it is, but it's as pure as that of a Rogers and Hammerstein show. The name of the production, The Book of Mormon. Church founders like Joseph Smith and Brigham Young appear in illustrative sequences, as does Jesus and an angel named Moroni. When delivered in musical comedy style, these vignettes float into the high altitudes of absurdity. Brantley particularly enjoyed a spirited, innocently obs obscenity-laden song about Joseph Smith. So really, from the start, right up to the present, you've got these uh, contrasting uh, viewpoints on the Book of Mormon. Party P. Pratt could not put the book down once he started reading it. Mark Twain called it chloroform in print. The young school teacher Oliver Cowdery dedicated his life to the Book of Mormon before hearing any of the text or even meeting Joseph Smith. The printing office apprentice John H. Gilbert called the book a very big humbug. Martin Harris returned from a meeting with uh, professor of Greek and Latin Charles Anthon convinced that Joseph was indeed a prophet. Anthon, who examined the characters, reportedly copied from the gold plates, reported years later that it was a trick, perhaps a hoax. So, that's one reason the, uh, to me, the Book of Mormon is so interesting, is these constant uh, contrasting points of view. It was a great uh, project to work on. I just thoroughly enjoyed the research, and I appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you. Questions? Yes. <coughs> Larry, the... Uh, Robert, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> the uh, article in the Wayne County newspaper uh, implies that there was some talk about the Book of Mormon before it came forth in, in, the, uh, in the area. Definitely. Even though there wasn't documented... Uh, any documentation on it, right? It referred apparently to some discussions that were going on, and so they were verbal, at least. Now let me read that again. Just about in this particular region, for some time past, much speculation has existed concerning a pretended discovery through superhuman means of an ancient record. Apparently, for months, yeah. is my impression. But, yeah, no documentation for that. Another question, please. Yes. <clears throat> how much of the Book of Mormon was translated with the uh, Yerman Thummim, and how much with the uh, uh, Seer Stone? Do we, do we know that? I think we have a pretty good idea, which is, um, Martin, when Martin and Joseph translated the 116 pages, at least for part of it, there was some kind of screen or blanket or something in between them, and according to Martin Harris, Joseph was using <coughs> the spectacles. I think it's good to call them. If you, Joseph Smith used the term Urim and Thummim generically to refer either to the spectacles that he, that he got from Moroni or the seer stone, which he found digging a well, 
he used Urim Thummim for both of them. So it gets very confusing. But uh, according to Martin and some, even Charles Anthon talked about the curtain between the translator and the scribe. So early in Martin Harris's work as scribe, Joseph was using the spectacles that came with the breastplate, and he was uh, that Moroni gave him. <coughs> but at some point, uh, Martin and Joseph went to using the seer stone. It's not clear whether they traded back and forth or not. But Martin Harris tells a story of, uh, and he and Joseph were translating. They went down to the river and, and threw rocks on the, on the Susquehanna just to take a break from translating. And according to Martin, when they went back, well, while they were there on the shore, he found a stone that looked like the seer stone. Now we're talking about the rock that Joseph discovered digging the well with Hiram and Willard Chase. And he found one that looked just like the seer stone, and when they went back, he put that in the hat and took out the seer stone. And when Joseph tried to translate, he couldn't, because he couldn't see anything in, in this rock. So, that, yeah, he All said, is dark as right, that's what he said. Now, I've got questions about that. Yeah. I wondered if Joseph was pulling Martin's leg. <laughs> because that seer stone was so important to Joseph Smith, I have a hard time believing he could be fooled. Mm -hmm. Anyway, oh, um, so, oh, I, I'll get to you. Okay. Um, I had an answer to his que uh, question, I thought, maybe. In some of my reading, I read that Hiram once told someone, did you come across this, that the glasses were way too big for Joseph and that he did not like them, he was uncomfortable, they did not fit him, and so he got rid of, no, he didn't use them fairly early on. That, according to the Smith family, that is one reason why he switched, was he didn't like to, because he they couldn't look big. through both of them at the same time. Right. Right. But... By the time Oliver came, of course, the 116 pages were all lost, and part of those he <coughs> used the spectacles, but with Oliver and the other people who acted as scribes like Emma, for our current published Book of Mormon, all of it, as far as we know, came from the seer stone. Hmm. Okay, but in your opinion, the translation didn't start until after Martin got back after seeing Charles Anthony. Correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. So before that time, was there a curtain? Was there a need for one? Well, I don't think they did any translating before Martin went to New York. Okay. But if he had the, uh, the curtain up, it was only because he, he didn't want anyone to see the uh, plates while he was copying characters that, that Martin took to Professor Anthem. Has anyone in recent times seen those characters? What is there? opinion of those characters. Well, you know, there there is a document, a so-called characters document, and in Joseph Smith papers, you probably got documents one for sale here, I imagine. <laughs> in documents one of the Joseph Smith papers, they have a photograph of the document, the so-called characters document, and I think linguists have attempted to make sense, and somebody has claimed to translate it, but I don't think it was from a respected scholar. So like when, when the, the linguists at BYU looked at it, I don't think they came to any conclusion about what language it was or, you know, anything. But it is written horizontally. <coughs> Anthon said the characters were vertical, and the description that Charles Anthon gives doesn't match up the characters document at all. But John Whitmer is the one who copied it, and he was apparently, there's, in Documents Volume 1, it has a lot of good information on various versions of the character's document. But the, the earliest one we have is this uh, John Whitmer copy, and it doesn't match up to Anthony's description at all. So, you don't know what to think exactly. But that's the one... That I think David Whitmer said that's the uh, that's a copy of the document that was taken to Anthon, but of course David Whitmer wasn't even on the scene 
in February of 1828 when the whole event happened. Yes. Um, one thing I hadn't heard tonight, I hadn't read before, I came tonight, was that you said John Gilbert commented on the Book of Mormon or, or something about it very late in life. Right. So right at the very end, you commented that John Gilbert called it humbug. Oh, yes. Yes, and so <laughs> I find it kind of disturbing that the guy who did all the corrections and the punctuation that thought it was humbug, but did he use those? That must have been from the earlier time. In the later time in life, when he was really old, did he still say he thought it was humbug and or, or extreme, extremely negative things? All his accounts of, of, that we have of him speaking or writing about the Book of Mormon all negative, negative, yeah. But he, he was, he did take his printing job seriously, yeah. so when he was punctuating it, he was being very careful, and he did a good job, you know, coming from a former copy editor, <laughs> did his best, and they let him take part of the manuscript home, and he was very careful to protect it, you know, so he did a good job as a printer, even though he was skeptical. And he provided a very valuable record of the uh, publication of the Book of Mormon. But no, he, he didn't. He thought it was humbug. That was his best phrase. Gary. So you spent years uh, wading through these materials. Um, I didn't notice in, this in the book. I don't think it's in the book. Has, have you come up with a narrative for this period of time that you think is as accurate, factually accurate, as possible? Well, in bits and places in the book I did, but I never put it <clears throat> into one narrative. Uh -huh. but, I mean, but you could. You, you, you have that, right? I, I assume that, I, that, got, that you... I've got something in mind. You okay, bet. all right. Yeah. Do you think we'll see it? What? Do you think we'll see it? Well, that's the, this is the first time I've thought of publishing such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> given your interest, okay, I'm inclined yeah, to, to do I that. Think, yeah, I think you that know? would be interesting. Yes. Yeah, I uh, have a neighbor that's researched a lot on seer stones and uh, scrying and so forth and so on. And uh -huh. his big concern now is that with the, the, the essay that the church came forth on the stone and the hat and the and so forth, what relevance, how, what was the method, or what utilization at that point was the, the gold plates? In other words, uh, was purpose? he channeling this, and, and were the plates aside? Has there been any thought or discussion or documentation on the methodology there? Um, Emma Smith said uh, Joseph would look in his hat, look at the seer stone in his hat, and hold it up so he could see whatever it is he saw and was dictating and she said the plates were there but they were covered with a cloth and I don't know if Emma or anyone else who said that the plates had any role in translation every account we have both hostile and friendly the translation occurred with Joseph Smith looking at the seer stone inside his hat so what relevance would, to people investigating the church, would the plates now be given the, the story of the stone? In my mind, the, the significance of the plates turns out to be Joseph Smith had them. They, the, he had the artifact. Yes. I remember Terrell Given saying something on a podcast a long time ago that there was a physicality that brought faith to people around him. And I I do see some mystique in that carrying weight where it's like, oh, the plates, the plates, and then obviously the witnesses, that's a big purpose of it. But it is curious that it you're is. like, oh, when it There's actually no came, doubt about it. When it came to the actual yeah. translation or transmitting, and, and it was covered. It's like it wasn't needed. Right. Some I think of these, it was needed for faith. the illustrations that you see don't help matters. Because no. there you see Joseph looking at the plates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. We don't have any account of Joseph looking at the plates while translating. Yes. Uh, I'm skipping my head here, but the Spalding Manuscript and the theories that, that came about when people looked at the Book of Mormon for the first time, they said, I've seen this before, but Spalding wrote it. Uh, do you address that at all in here? If I do, it's very brief. Um, 
but to the I haven't really investigated that thoroughly, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, the people who said, yeah, we've seen these names before, <coughs> Moroni, Nephi, and, and stuff like that, but at that time, the Spalding manuscript was considered lost, and then when they found it, it didn't have any of those names. And I think then somebody said, well, there was another manuscript that was lost, you know, well, it just gets into an endless... Uh, excuse making. Hmm. So, the, the manuscripts associated with Spalding that have been discovered, it's not true that they contain those. Yeah, names. and I wasn't referring so much to the manuscript oh. as people who had read the Book of Mormon said, I've heard this story before. Uh, Solomon Spalding told me this story. And then, of course, on, on another track, he wrote a manuscript. So, Oh, sure. What they had heard was the story that he told them. In fact, I have seen a copy of the original of an original Book of Mormon, where it says, "A Baptist minister told me Solomon Spalding wrote this book." <laughs> oh, That's interesting. Awesome. Mm -hmm. interesting. In an original Book of Mormon. I, I, I owned that Book of Mormon at one point. That was I, I can't believe you're bringing it up. That was the wow. inscription. I, yeah. I sold it. And it I bought it from Ken Sanders, and it did say right on there yeah. a. Someone told me a story that, and, that and was, was on the It was from the Haight family. Well, they were the uh, original owners of that book. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Well. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's researched to try and track that down, you know. Well, the story doesn't really go anywhere. When you start looking for the manuscript, it blows up. But the point is that the story was out there. Sure. Yeah. Lots of stories. Now, an another comment on that, if I might. And then I'm going to shut my mouth and listen because I'm... <laughs> I don't want to dominate here. The Book of Mormon was not translated. It was revealed. I mean, that's the only, that's the only interpretation you can get from it. There was right. no translation. Correction. It wasn't translated in the traditional sense no, at all. No. Revealed. Mm -mm. Yeah. yeah. So that, and then you get into mm -hmm. the uh, notion of an expanded translation. Blake Osler. Uh, implying that Joseph Smith added things while he was at it <coughs> through inspiration. Mm -hmm. Any yes. other questions? I, I was just going to make a comment. I would just, I'd, I'd love to hear from some of the people here as well as yourself. Um, you know, there, there are so many disturbing things that you read, some of them <coughs> that were, you know, you read here tonight that people have said, and and so we all have to you know, think about things seriously for ourselves. But one of the things that's always been just so faith-promoting for me, and I'm, I'm curious if others, uh, no matter what horrible things I read, is the fact that so many of those witnesses, the three and the eight, became uh, so disassociated with the church. And I mean, you might go so far as to say true enemies of the church. They hated Joseph, or they said really, you know, bad things about him, that he wasn't a prophet any longer, like the Whitmers, for example. And, uh, and, and so, you would think, and, and even Emma, too, um, I just reread the, that, uh, her interview with her son right, right before she died, which is so fascinating. You would think that after all those years, they'd say, okay, I can tell the truth now. You know, it was, it was all a hoax. And yet, not one single one, no matter how they, how much they were disassociated with the church, they never denied it or took it back. That's why I believe David Whitmer and John Whitmer are the best witnesses of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. One was in yeah. the three and one was in the eight. Uh -huh. And they both left the church in 1838, yeah, never they returned. Were angry. So they had no ulterior motive. Right. And, uh, but both of them right to the end of their lives. Of course, David Whitmer was giving all these interviews. Every time somebody wanted to know, he would sit down Martin and tell Harris the whole story. Too. Martin yes. Harris, too. Of course, he returned. Yeah, he so he's not as good a witness to me. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. Because once he returns, then he's got motive yeah. to... Yeah, okay, okay. What did the other Whitmer say? The, the one who was in the eight. What did, what did he write about Senior? it? Senior? Well, there, was, uh, there were Senior several of them. Sons. Two of them died in Missouri. And they were still um, in good fellowship in the church when they died. And, uh, of course, David and John. And then, 
Well, we could, yeah, I could take a minute and look it all up, but so, so two of them didn't ever fall out of uh, favor with Joseph Smith, you know. It was really David and John who were the key people who, but, and yet they are strong witnesses because they had a good reputation in Missouri of being honest and level-headed and everything else, and here they are both testifying in Missouri, the hotbed of anti-Mormonism, that the Book of Mormon is true. Let's give him a hand. Let me tell you a quick story since somebody brought up John H. Gilbert. <clears throat> um, a number of years ago, I uh, had found out about a copy of the Book of Mormon in 1830 that had two handwritten inscriptions by Gilbert as an older man, one in the front, pasted in the front, one in the back. <clears throat> and um, so I went to California and bought it from a dealer, took it to one of my good customers, and, uh, and I showed it to him and he was, and he just sat down and wrote me a check and I knew immediately that I'd undersold it because <laughs> he'd never bought anything without beating me up on price first. And <clears throat> later, um, you know, so in those inscriptions, Gilbert had said what his role was and, you know, referred to it as the Mormon Bible and so on. And it was, they were terrific. But <clears throat> that book was later offered in a dealer catalog for a million dollars. And I sold it for a tenth of that. <laughs> yeah, it didn't sell at that price, but uh, what year? anyway, just to show you what kind What year approximately? What time frame um, that would have been, uh, <clears throat> I want to say early 90s. Okay. Would you say it's safe to assume you regret selling it on that occasion? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because I did well on it and I yeah. really didn't have any room to complain, but... but the yeah. value of a Book of Mormon in the early 90s was far lower than it is now. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. yeah. so it, no, it was a good deal for me. It just later when that all happened, I thought, wow. <laughs> but I've seen that happen on a number of things. Uh, I just happen to be more reasonable than everybody else in pricing. <laughs> Kurt, anyway. Right. Kurt, did, did, it, so did it sell eventually? Not um, a million, but did it? it? Do you know where it is now? I... I know kind of where it is. is it I don't think it's possession? the same. It's not with the same guy yeah, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that bought it from me. But it's it came way down in price. I know okay. that. But uh, anyway, um, thank you so much for coming.